all things surrounding you, which you can't eat or drink, and which weren't produced by Mother Nature, were drawn on a piece of paper before they were made. The word design would really encompass architecture and everything that is made by human hand, from instructions that are put on paper by people who call themselves designers. One of the main concerns of the industrial designer includes anything you will see in a home. Even rugs on the floors and the frames of the pictures on the walls are designed by industrial designers. That would include major and minor kitchen appliances, utensils, vacuum cleaners, brooms, shovels, all the yard equipment, and so forth. An industrial designer devotes his attention to such concepts as multiple seating for schools, theaters, airports, assemblies of storage cubicles, wall partitions, built-in workstations, lighting, business machines, telephones, etc., etc. In its broadest concept, it is as old as Homo sapiens on this globe. Excavations from the times of early cave dwellers have produced tools, weapons, vessels, which were not only functional in their purpose and choice of available materials, but also responding to man's eternal quest for beauty. Henry Glass, 1981. That's the only thing I have plenty of, baby. Dream a while, scheme a while, you'll show the fun. Oh, happiness, and I guess all the things that you have been crying for, baby. Gee, I'd like to see you looking swell, Ooh, baby. Diamond bracelets, ah, that Woolworth doesn't sell. <laughs> but until that lucky day, baby, you know darn well, I can't give you anything but love. My name is Ellie Gass. My maiden name was Knopp, K-N-O-P-P. -P. And I was born in Vienna. When we were young, when we were very young, 14 years old, we went to a dancing school. But by the time we were 16, we thought, my girlfriend and I, we thought we outgrew the dancing school and we went to a cafe house. And you sit at the table and you wait till a young man comes and asks. Sometimes it was an older man too. <laughs> and I sat there and here comes that very good looking guy with his dreamy blue eyes and chestnut brown locks. And he asked me for a dance, and Henry was an excellent dancer. And I was a very good dancer, too. And we had a few very nice dances, and uh, he asked me for a date and we made a date. He took me out to a restaurant where you sat in a loge and you could draw a curtain. <laughs> so I insisted the curtain have to stay open. <laughs> we had a dinner 
And he was very charming, and then we had another date and another date. So it developed in a good relationship. I was married on my birthday, March the 4th, 37. We lived in a very nice building. A distant cousin was the manager. And of course, he hired his cousin uh, architect to design that. And instead of payment, we got five years free rent. He moved in and had it all furnished. By the time I married, it was all ready. Everything was ready. I had not one word to say about it. At that time, a lot of people who got married lived with their parents because they couldn't afford a two-room apartment. And here I had an apartment with a terrace and a bathroom. Many apartments didn't have bathrooms in Vienna. To Henry's big surprise, I said, see, I didn't go to school that long like you, but I knew that people have bathrooms. <laughs> Hitler was already in power in Germany. And when Hitler marched in, all of a sudden people had flags already and hung it out and everybody left and right was a Nazi. Hitler was very enthusiastically greeted in Austria when he marched in. The Austrians said it wasn't true, but I was there, I saw it, that they were ready to have uh, the Nazi rule. It had partly to do because people were out of work. And when a nation is poor, they would vote for anything to hope they better themselves. The anti-Semitism was very much greeted in Austria. Henry was related to the manager of the building, and the manager of the building was racially Jewish also. A lot of Jews converted because they didn't give a damn if they are Jewish or whatever they are. So the next good thing was to become a Catholic. For Hitler, it was race, not religion. There was a girl in the building, and she was a very pretty girl, and she thought she was crazy about Henry, and Henry was crazy about her. That didn't make any difference that I was his fiancé. The men always were free to roam, <laughs> and I know that he had an affair with her. 
but it didn't work out to her advantage. And that made her so mad. And when Hitler came, she uh, denounced him. He had been at a party and had um, sung some songs that had been banned by the Fuhrer. And whether he was aware that they'd actually been banned or not is irrelevant because it wouldn't have deterred him. And somebody turned him into the Gestapo, went to the uh, office and said, you know, he did such and so. And then, you know, being Jewish, racially Jewish, and being one of the managing group of that apartment building, a very important person. It was all against him. And so the combination of his having insulted the Fuhrer and all of the Jewish blood, which was my father's family was all Jewish and had converted to Catholicism probably, I don't know exactly when that happened, but I don't think it was very much before this event. If he would have been just a plain, simple guy, they wouldn't have been after him. If he wouldn't have been a ladies' man the way he was, I mean, he, he just liked women. Uh, nothing would have happened to him. That's the price he had to pay. Those three guys and Henry were there, and they said, you have to leave the country in 10 days. And Henry said, I'm not going to leave. The other two guys, of course, said, we, are, we, we have everything ready, we are going. And Henry said, I'm not going from Vienna. I was born here, I love Vienna. It's my homeland. I, I, I wouldn't even dream of leaving Vienna. And the guy said, well, then you will be, we'll wind up in a concentration camp. And Henry said, no, I want to see that. Half an hour he was in the, in the bus going to the concentration camp. He was not put in a cattle car, and he was put in a typical um, compartment car for uh, 30s railroad. But one of the people in the compartment, I guess, had some knowledge of where they were going and what was going to happen, and uh, didn't like the idea, so um, tried to escape by jumping out of the window of, of a moving train. He got up and made his move towards the window, and the guard who was standing uh, by the door to the alleyway shot him, killed him, right in front of my father's eyes. My father was uh, interred initially in Dachau. But Henry had to dig ditches. And he had weak wrists all his life. He couldn't dig ditches. He wasn't raised digging ditches. He was an architect. Apparently the dirt was hard, well, heavy clay, and so he was modeling. He was making little figurines out of the clay that everybody else was digging. But for some reason, the guard recognized, oh, there's some artistic talent. Maybe we can exploit that in some manner. So he got my father out of the ditch and took him to the commandant of the camp. After they found out he's an architect, they gave him a job to design the cemetery for the SS. They used his talent. But there were other things. He suffered just like anybody else. At one point, it was decided that he would go to Buchenwald. The reason for my father's transfer was that they were uh, building a, a cemetery for the uh, noble SS that had died in the war. So they needed someone to design the cemetery. There was one guy in the concentration camp who disappeared and they counted every night. They counted the prisoners and one was missing. They had to strip, stand naked in a freeze 
freezing temperature and said, you have to stand there till we find that prisoner who tries to escape. Henry was still young and uh, he was in good shape. And uh, a lot of elderly men just dropped dead, froze to death. That he told me. I'm still healthy. I hope very much that you are healthy, just like me. Dearest Christmas wishes in love, your hands. He had to keep everything very short. As I know the story, when he got to the United States, Somewhere along the line, I think he was doing work for the Department of the Navy. He ended up doing something with ship design. And in any case, uh, somebody heard about this experience he'd had in, in concentration camp and asked him if he could recreate the uh, work that he'd done there. And my father's memory was still very sharp, I guess, because he was able to recreate the whole thing from memory. And then I started to go from one organization to another organization in Vienna and had no success. My mother was trying desperately to get my father out of concentration camp. You know, she was a relatively new bride and, you know, so still romantically smitten at this point. <laughs> Henry had an uncle in Switzerland who got in touch with a lawyer, a Dutch lawyer, and he helped me in Berlin to get into the Gestapo. So she at first went to the Gestapo in Vienna, and I believe that this guy led her on for some period of time, but enjoyed her visits, because as I'd mentioned, my mom was a beautiful woman. But eventually my mom, she's no dummy either, figured out this guy's powerless. He's just a little puppet here. He can't do anything. So the Dutch lawyer, the way I understand it, ended up getting her an audience with the Gestapo in Berlin, who actually had the power to do something. The Gestapo couldn't say no, that I'm not allowed to come in. And uh, of course, I was young and cute. The guy. I still see that guy in front of me. He said, well, why do you want your husband out of the concentration camp? You can divorce him if he is in the concentration camp. And I said, the lawyer didn't say a word. And I said, you know, how would you feel if you would be in the concentration camp and your wife writes you she wants a divorce? Wouldn't it be better if you let him out? Let him go to America. I have all the papers ready for him and I don't have any papers for me. You can see it. I, they are only for Henry Glass. Of course, I didn't bring my papers. <laughs> and... Uh, let him go to America, and then I tell him I will, will divorce him. The guy believed me. I've always felt this story is kind of a reach. I'm just trying to think, you know, a Nazi Gestapo coming down to the concentration camp, it doesn't seem like a very convincing reason to let somebody out. First of all, the Germans love the Viennese women. They were so cuddly and so sweet and so nice in comparison to those shroff German language. <laughs> the, the women were not Viennese. They had a special charm, especially for the Germans. So I was lucky. He, 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 he liked me. He said, in 10 days, your husband will be out at the concentration camp. 
You can pick him up from the Westbahnhof. And he came off the train. And Henry's mother didn't recognize him. Of course, I recognized him right away. I don't know. To me, it's always been like, there's more to the story that I, we have never heard. And, um, my mother is, in many ways, a very private woman. And so I just always had the sense there's, there's things that she doesn't want to say, and she'll take them to the grave. I'm sure she charmed this Gestapo commandant and as to how much that figured into Henry's release and so on and so forth. He just took sympathy upon her. Or I, I don't know. But I, I think there, there was more to it than just the words. Henry got out and 10 days afterwards, a sickness broke out. And if he would have been there 10 days longer, they would have never let him get out because that was hushed up. Nobody knew about that sickness in the concentration camp. But he got out before, so he was lucky. Over 20 members of Henry's extended family, cousins, aunts, uncles, perished in the concentration camps. Their names are marked on Henry's family tree with crosses a sobering reminder. Henry suffered from repressed memories of his Holocaust experience for the rest of his life. His way of dealing with unpleasantness was to repress the thoughts. And so they'd find a way out in other ways. And one of the ways uh, that they found their way out was uh, the uh, survivor guilt. Virtually all of his relatives were put to death. Um, and aside from just his immediate family, people all around him were being put to death, and he wasn't. And then she, she also said that post Henry's release, the Dutch lawyer offered her a job um, to work for him, and um, obviously she didn't take it. She went to New York to be with her, be with her husband. I had all the papers ready, and then he just packed, and I was sick at the time. He left in January, and I came in May 30th on decoration day, all dressed in white. When I came here, I landed in New York and I had a job right off the boat for the 1939 World's Fair. It was the anthracite coal exhibit, and it was really mainly my design. Then I went into business for myself, meaning that I designed some furniture. I sold a sketch here and another one there, and that's the best I could do for a while. Henry Glass, 1990. I was surprised in New York not about the high buildings. I was surprised that there are those rooming houses. And of course, that's all we could afford, to live in a rooming house with bed bugs, with mice. At night, he designed the chairs, the tables, and the next day he went where the stores, where the manufacturers, where the small business up and down the road. He sold some designs, and if he wasn't lucky, he didn't. By God, somehow he made that work. So many immigrants that had skills and wherever they came from when they got to America, that just kind of all fell by the wayside. But my father was an exception to that. One day he came home and he said, I found the most beautiful penthouse on Central Park West. So we moved up there. We had no money, but that didn't bother Henry.
was the most beautiful place. And when we moved, I cried. When we left New York, I cried. I didn't cry when I left Vienna, but I cried New York I loved so much. I was so much at home in, in New York. Following Pearl Harbor, opportunities for designers dried up in New York. So Henry and Ellie moved to Chicago, where Henry had made contact with several furniture manufacturers. One of the gentlemen at the Museum of Modern Art recommended me to an outfit in Chicago. The first job I had was to design a line of wartime furniture using non-essential materials, mainly plywood and masonite, and that was quite successful. We were strongly employed by the Army and Navy, and that kept me out of the draft. They thought I was more valuable as a civilian. Henry Glass, 1990. We had a place on Boabash in the Yonkers building. Henry went to work, and I walked out, and I made the mistake instead of walking to the Michigan Avenue. I walked west, and Chicago was dirty, smelly, and I cried. Tears were running up down my, my cheeks. So I, but I got used to it. In 1945, Henry read about American visionary, designer, and architect Buckminster Fuller's Dymaxion House. The house was to be built from factory kits and assembled at any site. Henry sent in his $6,500 deposit, but except for two prototypes, these houses were never built, and Henry's deposit was returned. So then Henry started to look around for a lot and of course, again, he started out in uh, Kenilworth to look for a lot. <laughs> and when he showed the design of our house, the people got together and bought the lot back with a profit for us because they didn't want the house there. So Henry looked and he found this lot here in Northfield. <laughs> Before the media was talking about the energy crisis and living green, Henry P. Glass built one of the first solar houses in America. The year was 1948. Chicago in the early and mid 20th century became a center for modern architecture with the designs of Frank Lloyd Wright, Mies van der Rohe, and the Keck brothers, who were pioneers in the field of passive solar housing. The Keck experiments greatly influenced what Henry Glass was going to do. In turn, he decided to become the architect of his own house. Henry sighted the house to face south so that it gained more natural light from the southern exposure. There are also thermal pane windows, an innovation at the time too, which increased the amount of sunlight coming in in the wintertime. So, you know, these are today a very common building uh, approaches or components, but back then, uh, very, very new. And so the idea was uh, thermal loading through the windows and absorption on the black floor. The purpose of the inverted roof was to uh, take advantage of solar heating. I mean, that was my father's uh, thinking. So it was a solar house that was uh, built in 1940, 48, 49. It was probably one of the first solar houses anywhere.
A dispute with neighbors who wanted the house removed because they thought it ugly ended with the berm being built to block their view. That woman was so unhappy with our house that one day, one truckload after the other came and dumped that awful looking clay right up on her property. I just cried and cried, but there was nothing that could be done. They said they must be communists to build a house like this. Then on top, we spoke with an accent. The house was built of redwood, which in those days was an alternative material and inexpensive. Most people in the area preferred brick. The ceiling is really an insulation material, but Henry liked the color of the ceiling, so he didn't put a white ceiling on. It was just nice, the light coming in on that ceiling. When we lived here, all of a sudden people came and went around and looked at the house, and they walked in like uh, it's allowed, you know. Uh, and they said, oh, we heard about that unusual house. It was, to Henry, it was a normal house. That's what people should live in. And to the people here, it looked unusual. There was a gate that nobody could come over to the, the people, to the rich people. I call it the rich side of Dickens Road. Peter wanted to sit on that gate. And the gate really belonged to the rich people. And I said, Peter, don't you ever, ever sit on that side of the street because over there in this house, there lives a witch. <laughs> and I'm sure that boy went home and told his mother what happened, so she knew that I called her a witch. And I think two or three weeks later, they moved. Because we are still here. And they are gone. In 1946, the same year that Henry opened his own design studio, he convinced the Art Institute of Chicago to establish a course for industrial design. He taught this course for over 20 years. I met uh, Henry and Ellie Glass in approximately 1950. I came to Chicago from San Francisco to study um, design. Henry was one of, in fact, the first uh, industrial design instructor that I, that I had. To, chance to study with, and uh, I'm very privileged to have crossed Henry's path. He set for me a very solid foundation for industrial design, which I was able to build on and have what I would consider a successful career. He had a lot of conferences, furniture shows that he had to go to in the South, and he was so against the way black people were treated in the United States that he used to use the colored bathrooms rather than the white bathrooms just to make a statement. And, and he did this, you know, in the face of his clients. So, I mean, that was gutsy. Actually, um, a person of color in Chicago in the 50s, as a professional, was very rare, unless you were a doctor, a lawyer, or a minister or something. But it, as a business person, they, they, we, were rare, we were rare people. I, for instance, uh, walked streets of Chicago for a very long time looking for employment and uh, was referred to places by classmates of mine. But, uh, as soon as I appeared in the place, uh, they no longer needed anyone, which is an old story. I had a stroke of luck from the heavens that Henry called me and asked me if I would come and work for him, which was the first time I had a place to work inside a, a, a professional design organization. And I was probably out there as a professional designer for somewhere close to 15 years before I ever met another African-American designer. And when I did meet the one other one that was uh, in America, uh, we thought we were the only two for a long time. Now, of course, there are many more. And it 
It was a nice evening just before Christmas, and he took out an envelope. And in that envelope were $3,100 bills. So that was a nice surprise. It doesn't happen very often in a designer's life to get a penny from heaven like this. Henry Glass, 1990. Everything Henry decided, he went with me head shopping. He designed the dress I should be wearing. Everything Henry was involved in my life. Uh, 25th anniversary, he made the design and nowhere did you see that at that time that they made jewelry out of gold wire. And it was very stunning. Whenever I wore that, I mean, it, people just, it shocked them, you know, because it wasn't seen before. Another glass innovation was the hairpin leg for tables and chairs. He borrowed the concept from Ellie's hairpins. My father would have his ideas. He would bring them home. He'd spread them out on the dining room table, and he'd say, which do you like the best? So, I mean, we all got an education that way. You think about it, his whole job was about using his judgment as to what looked good. And, you know, that's how he made a living. He was very conscious of economy in design, about how the pieces would be cut from a sheet so that he would have very little wastage um, uh, of raw materials and so on. So he was very conscious of things like that. My parents were generous, but they were conservative about, about things, you know? You didn't waste. I knew my wine and my beer from my European upbringing, but I didn't know much about American mixed drinks. And I did have more than three martinis, and I was blasted. It was pretty bad. Henry Glass, 1990. Henry loved to have parties. He loved to go to parties, and he loved even more to have parties. I mean, sometimes it was just neighbors, you know, but more frequently the parties were for clients and, and business associates. My mom would make a huge pot, usually a huge pot of goulash, and they'd have rye bread and potatoes and vegetable and wine and beer, and then she would always make some kind of fabulous dessert. Henry always had music, and he played guitars, and we were singing, and of course the people liked to hear us yodel. And we always had singing and dancing. And the liquor flowed and the food was fabulous. I mean, people had a great time at our parties. I remember my school years, they were very, very happy years. Time you could leave school was when you were 14 years old, and my mother wanted me to go to school till I was 16, and I was eager to get into a profession so that I earn some money. And so I went out, and on a Sunday, I bought a newspaper, and I found a place where I went to introduce myself that I would like to be an apprentice. And then I was for three years an apprentice. Then I had to make an exam at the guild, and I had to uh, make a dress, and then I became a journeyman. And then I had to work four years as a journeyman to get my P1. 
paper for being a master dressmaker. And I did this in four years. She was so good that she could look at a photograph in a magazine and, you know, in a fashion magazine and then make the dress. And she did. I always wanted to work in Henry. Couldn't stand my customers. He <laughs> made my life miserable when the customer came because he felt like the customer is more important than he is. But going to the art institute that was out of the house, he got me the job because he was teaching at the art institute. And then we knew some friends who were big shots at the YMCA, and they needed some teachers. I taught pattern making, dressmaking, tailoring. It satisfied my talent so that it isn't completely wasted. And it made him happy too. So as far as Ellie's contribution was concerned, I, I think undoubtedly the, the key role was one of support. Of course, she tested and modeled a lot of things that he did. I'm sure she sat in a lot of chairs that, that he was designing. And of course, uh, the jewelry and the shoes and the clothes and everything that he designed for her. Oh, my mother was the person who did keep things going. Um, she made sure, you know, the house was together. She had the meals on the table. She, you know, took care of the laundry. She ironed 21 shirts a week. There are notable examples in the history of design where a husband and wife work together as a team. That did not seem to be the case with Ellie. It seemed as though uh, she barely even entered the studio. I mean, that was Henry's domain. If she was calling him for lunch, she would call on the phone. She wouldn't walk over there to come see him. Uh, that I always found very interesting. He couldn't have really had his business without my mom. She was the glue that held the whole thing together. Well, I found out that Henry was fooling around. Now it's called telephone sex with the wife of the Vice Consul from Vienna. You know, my father was European. It was accepted and understood in Austria that uh, men could play around. I mean, it was, it was expected almost, so um, he did. So I decided to have a facelift, and Henry came home from the office, and I didn't come home. And he was wondering where I am. He called everybody he knew, and then he called my girlfriend, and she said, Oh, you don't know? Ellie's in the hospital. He said, in the hospital? What for? <laughs> she has a facelift. Well, he was so mad. And of course, I looked awful, banged up. And, uh, but my face was beautiful, you know, not a wrinkle, nothing. I think it still helps me now to look younger than I am. In spite of all that, my father always adored my mother. Um, she was always the light of his life. And um, I mean, right until the end. Ellie and Henry had a tumultuous and exciting life during their 66 years together. Although Ellie could have had a career of her own, from the start, she made Henry the project of her lifetime. So all the best. I guess I don't have to add anything. This is all I have to say. Yours truly, Henry. 
on his deathbed, he was lying there with his head facing to the left, and the family was gathered around, and my brother was on his left. My brother and my niece were on his left, and my mother and I were on his right. And uh, my brother started smiling, and my mother said, are his eyes open? And he said, he nodded, yes. And so I said, he wants to see Ellie. So I took his head, he was too weak to move, and I took his head and I turned his head to face my mother. And that, I think that's what he, that was what he wanted to see, he wanted to see Ellie. That was the last thing he saw. In his lifetime, Henry received 52 patents and numerous awards. He was eventually decorated by the Republic of Austria, the country he was forced to flee. And his work is included there in the Museum for Applied Arts. Even those who have never heard of Henry Glass are familiar with his designs. A living room suite he did for the William Brenner Furniture Corporation in 1952 can still be seen on I Love Lucy reruns. I got to, uh, to see him in the historical context because I came late to knowing Henry, so I was able to see him as the artist. I could see him in the same pantheon as some of the great uh, designers in history. If it was collapsible, and he did a lot of collapsible stuff, um, it would collapse down to uh, less volume than you could imagine possible. It actually wasn't until very near his, his death that I gained an appreciation of the sheer volume of stuff that he produced. It's just enormous um, productivity. Uh, and part of that is just due to the fact that he loved his work so much that he just never stopped designing. He was designing all of his waking hours. They were an amazing couple, and um, I guess the one thing I can add is that of all the people I've ever known in my life, they were the most fun. They're the most wonderful people I've ever known. <laughs>